Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's brief ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, the pattern we're about to settle into was was relatively well uh, predicted last week in the weather forecast models, and that is this uh, kind of time period here uh, after the 10th, we're going to see some warmer conditions across a broad sector here of North America. We will see more frequent troughing that's going to be kind of anchored around the Hudson Bay, and that's going to set us up with an interesting storm track moving forward, which we're going to talk about here in just a few moments. This next week, in terms of precipitation anomalies, though, much of California, the Pacific Northwest, getting into the mountains, is going to go over to a drier pattern. That's been after a very, very wet and snowy uh, December and early January, especially for the Pacific Northwest. The storm track is going to feature one interesting event that's going to come right over the top of the Rockies, a short event that's going to cut through the Midwest before kind of pulling into the Mid-Atlantic and then getting out over the Atlantic. And uh, But you can see that outside of that, much of this next seven days, maybe outside of the Canadian prairie is going to be uh, relatively dry. Now, some bigger things that we just need to keep up to date on. We did finally get the, the data from um, the National Climatic Data Center showing us the statewide average temperature ranks. I just want to show you here, every state with the number 127 in it had its warmest December on record. And again, a lot of states with 127, but many with 126 as well. So this is a very, very mild December. In fact, in the state of Texas, uh, their average temperature departure from almost 12 degrees. Second place was 1993 at a 6.5 degree difference. So this was extremely anomalous. And we've talked about it. This was the flow. Big ridge set up here over the Aleutian Islands most of the month of December. And that took the flow around, cutting into the west like this. And it ran up over a large ridge that at times moved both east and west of this position, but still took that storm track in that general direction. By the way, we did add three more billion dollar weather disasters to the 2021 list. That would have been the Colorado fires, the December 10th severe weather outbreak, and the December 15th severe weather outbreak in the Midwest. So I just want to bring you up to speed on that. But as we begun the month of January, this is how the pattern has shifted. We've now seen more of our troughing kind of retrograding or moving or building a bit to the West. And that's going to be something we're going to have to talk about with this upcoming pattern. Because as we start to see these shifts happening away from what we saw in December, we, we really want to just get the, the answer to why are these shifts happening and can we use them to predict where we're going. So a lot of that has to do with still the tropical connection. And I'm going to go to the MJO first. We are still somewhat in phase seven and we're coming out briefly into phase eight. And the models are attempting to keep the MJO just somewhere over the Western Pacific. Do you see how the forecast keeps wrapping it back around in this direction? So that means it's not gonna pop out and come curling around you know, over here into the Indian Ocean again and do a reset. And what that makes me concerned about is that MJO phase seven in January has a larger ridge in place here. MJO phase eight in January has a larger ridge here. Now this isn't a slam dunk, a guarantee that that's gonna happen, but that means that the tropics are gonna promote more ridging in place here and then downstream troughing basically in the eastern half of North America. What would really make this pattern highly amplified is if we get a big ridge building somewhere into the, uh, into the Atlantic here. Now stretching out the forecast models, this is the 12Z GFS, we do see that the wave number starts to shrink. We got one, two, three troughs by the time we get out there at about day 11 or day 12. Now, small wave number patterns like this, which, by the way, the ensembles typically always go to, that means that the, the pattern tends to either stay stuck, which we have a ridge here, all right, and a trough there, and then another ridge here. Those patterns tend to get stuck or they like to retrograde or move back to the, um, you know, back here to the, to the west. And why that's so important is our La Nina, this is the current look at what's going on with these ocean temperatures. That retrograding system was supported by the colder water that's here in the Gulf of Alaska. And it's also supported by the fact that most of the strength of our La Nina is back over here on the eastern side of the Pacific Ocean. We've been studying that for a long time. And we, so we know what happens when all that cooler water is back there. But I want to tell you something about it first. You do see that in this region, as of late, over the last 70s, we had had some warmer water showing up. And that means that these trade winds are really highly variable right now, and that's changing the rate at which we're getting upwelling and, of course, downwelling on the other side of the ocean. But we know that when the La Nina is focused over there on that side of the ocean, the ridges tend to move back here pretty far to the west, and the flow pattern likes to do something like this. So that tends to anchor the coldest air from the Hudson to the Canadian Prairie. It lets it out frequently across the northern tier of the United States. But with ridging to the south, we tend to get an active storm track in between. 
So we see that in the temperature field right now. This is the forecast from January 21st to February 21st. That cold air is coming in around like this. We might be biased a bit too cold here. I think we have some uh, snow contamination here, just uh, keeping the temperatures a little bit too cold. But overall, we're going to see, I think, a lot of clipper systems and also systems that come out in here through the Tennessee and Ohio Valley out of the Mid-South. And I say that because the precipitation pattern over that same 30-day time period has now consistently shown this area to be quite active. And look, coming into the west, that's where we tend to see you know, our best uh, cases here for, for snow. But without a strong subtropical component to the jet stream, this isn't a, a situation where we tend to build up just enormous snowpack in, in California, although we're doing pretty darn good right now with snowpack as it is. So that's kind of a look at what we're expecting here over the next you know, four to six weeks, getting out here almost to the end of February with the new long range euro. What we have in the meantime, though, is that system I mentioned at the beginning coming out of Alberta. I don't know if you kind of call it a hybrid system because it comes out of Alberta, then dives into the Midwest and then exits east. And so it's kind of a clipper that turns into almost like a, what I would call a Miller B. But you're looking here at, um, at, at, at snow. So we got this area in through here that's possibly going to be picking up, you know, some decent snows. That's the European model forecast, and this is the GFS. And overall, there's some similarity here, a little bit difference in the tracks. We'll see that in a second. But could be pulling snow back through, my gosh, it's been quite snowy in Tennessee, Kentucky, but maybe getting it over back here into the western side of the Carolinas. This is a big question mark. It's all about timing and the coldness at the time that it gets there. But this system is forecast to jump out into the ocean and not hug the coast. So when I think about all of that, I just want to remind you that so far up to this point in the year, that corridor into there has really missed out on a lot of snow. Same thing in parts of New England. Now, we got good lake effect snow going right now on Monday. Saw that all day today with these winds just racing across the lakes, which are still only about 7% covered in ice. That cold air coming across there produced some pretty good lake effect snow. But boy, the West is doing great. So far, the Sierra Nevada, by the way, have already beat the last two years in terms of total uh, snowfall accumulation. And, and what I mean by that is if you melted it all down, uh, where we are the past two years at the end of the year versus where we are now, already doing better this year. So this is a great scenario. But again, we need to see where this is all going because this is an area, again, that over the uh, start of this uh, cold season, this winter, we've missed out a lot of snow. And so we need to see if we're going to be getting some snow into that area. This, again, is percent of normal snowfall through January 10th. Well, the models give the best probability of the heavy snow right in through here. All right, you see that this is the chance of getting better than three inches, and we're looking at those probabilities somewhere between probably 40 and 60 percent right here in the core of this. And then as that system comes over the Appalachian Mountains, it will move off shortly. So that's the current forecast, which is going to prevent another massive nor'easter. But there's still some uncertainty as to whether or not this system could turn north and hit the northeast. But the presence of that large ridge in the west, you can see that over the next week, we're not expecting much snow at all in the west. So where is the system coming from that's going to impact the midsection of the country? And where does it live right now? It's this right here. And the flow over the next few days is going to be doing something like that. And it's going to follow that flow coming down into this trough. So when this wave over the next few days finally gets over British Columbia, we're going to watch it right here to get picked up by the main jet stream flow and then follow these stronger winds because this long wave pattern we're in right now, I think, is one we're going to stay in quite a bit. So let's go take a look at it by looking at both uh, the GFS on the left and the European on the right. So we started off today on Monday with our lake effect snow, pretty strong snow bands there. And as we then play our way into Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm going to be watching one kind of lead uh, system coming out with this one. All right. And you're going to see it right there. This is going to be Wednesday night to Thursday morning. It's a lead clipper kind of coming down like this, and it will also make the turn pretty quickly. The European's the main model that's picking up on it, so we're going to watch that one carefully. Now, what you're going to see is that systems continue to try to form here along the East Coast, but because of the depth and how far east that trough is, this is where they're going to eventually form. So these are not the big nor'easters that can run right up here along the coast. But our second system by Friday morning has already come out of Alberta and Saskatchewan and the GFS, and it's already here in the, uh, in the European model. And what we see is that that system is going to dive south, come right through the western Corn Belt in the upper Midwest, and there'll be enough cold air on this to be producing some snow. 
Now again, we have good model agreement, but this wave is still just south of the Aleutian Islands. There's plenty of time for it to change position and adjust. In fact, last Thursday, I thought it was going to be this cutoff low that was over here that was going to be moving through this section of the country by this time. So you can see how much things change just in a couple of days. Well, that trough then comes through, look at this, comes right into parts of Tennessee, Kentucky. The models are a little different on the speed with the European a bit faster, which again is kind of odd. And the European takes it and tosses it out here through the Carolinas and pushes it out in open ocean pretty quickly. Now behind it, there is another weak little clipper coming through, some more snow for the upper Midwest. The GFS tries to keep this closer to the Carolina coast on Sunday but in both scenarios really keeps the systems out to open ocean. It's gonna take a lot to pull these systems from the Carolinas north, and the current model runs are not doing that, and I don't have a lot of evidence to say why they would. Behind it in the cold air, expect more snow. See that there? This is early next week. So again, we stitch all that together, and what we find is this could be a corridor of some snowy weather right in through here. Lots can still change, including the location of that heaviest band, but we're getting some pretty good evidence here from some model agreement that that could be the case. Plus, remember, we do have our ensemble agreement showing that same corridor having a good chance at picking up about three inches or more of snowfall. Now, when we get out into week two, take a look at this. The trough has now moved a bit farther to the west, and the ridge has moved offshore. So that's a retrograding pattern. When, when it shifts west, it's because you're advecting planetary vorticity, moving the whole system to the west rather than progressing to the east. And with systems curling around the base of this trough, this whole region in here is going to go over active as we get out there into what will be the third week of January. We can already start to see it. Now, I know you're seeing some browns in here, but these were much a much deeper shade in previous runs, telling us that the models are slowly starting to increase the likelihood of there being an active storm track in here throughout week two. But because the ridge is still pretty close to the west, that whole region is still showing up drier. I'm watching for systems to do one of three paths. Got it? Those are the three that I'm going to be watching most carefully as we progress out here from about the 20th through the 25th of January. On the temperature side of things, boy, look at this. Temperatures on Tuesday already going back over very mild as that downslope flow plus the ridge builds in. The cold air tries to exit east, but it takes a little bit of time. By Wednesday into Thursday, we're talking upper 50s getting into parts of Nebraska. You may crack 60. And just so you know, that's about 25 degrees up above the climatological average. Well, on Friday, we start to watch the system that we discussed over the weekend evolve. So by Saturday, there's plenty of cool air on the back side of this. And as we kind of play this forward, getting out here into Sunday, that's going to be our next push of some cooler air. But how this pattern shifts into day uh, 5 through 10, just watch this. You see right in through here is kind of the boundary, right? The warmer weather compared to average to the west. The cold air kind of anchored around troughing that's over the uh, Hudson Bay. But as I go from day 5 through 10 to 10 through 15, now you see that that's backing up, right? So our storm track is going to be one of these three paths. Got it? Now, good news is, is that this cold air, while it's going to be at times 10 to 20 degrees colder than the climatological average, it's not linked up with the polar vortex. The polar vortex is quite strong, very steady and stable, and it is sitting over the polar regions. You see it's just north here of Greenland. And at this point, we don't forecast over the next 15 days any sort of large disruption. That'd be where this gets squeezed or stretched or weakened. So this isn't necessarily going to be something where the tropospheric polar vortex sits underneath a disrupted stratospheric polar vortex. We may have to wait until um, the month of February to see any sort of significant disruption. So I'll keep an eye on it. Report back to you again on Thursday. Thanks.